Hello everyone and welcome back to Web Security. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you all about the concept known as injection. So this is a very important security concept that comes up in a number of different uh, contexts. So the concept of injection deals with the concept of we might have some blob of data that we're going to be performing some sort of operation. We're talking very abstractly. We're going to perform some sort of operation on this blob of data. But we don't just statically know what that full blob of data is. We might need to either concatenate our some static data with some user data, with some static data, or something like that, build up this larger blob of data. And we might have we might do that through concatenation, we might do that through some sort of replace operation. Again, this is just speaking very abstractly. We'll see with some examples what I'm really talking about here. But we have some sort of larger data context where we need to insert data into that. It's a very common operation that comes up all over the place, not even just in web security, but certainly comes up in web security as well. Because it's, it's very common, right, that we're going to have a user interacting with our system and what does it mean for a user to interact with our system? Well, it means that that user is going to be supplying our system with data, and we're going to need to move that data into different contexts and put it into other bits of data and like kind of inject it into some other data. So this is a very uh, important operation, it turns out, from a security perspective, because we need to be very careful when we go and start performing these kind of data injection operations. OK, let's look at some examples. So we can imagine some application that needs to run, let's say, the date command, right? We've got this user bin date program. Let's say we call system on date. So system is an operation that exists within you know, Python, C, all sorts of languages. And what system does is it goes out, it finds the program, and it runs it. So specifically, how does it do that? Well, it runs, ultimately, the exec VE system call, right? If we want to launch a process, as we've learned in the past, if we want to launch a process, we're going to be using the exec VE system call. So specifically, we're going to be launching up a shell, which maybe seems surprising, right? We're just trying to run the date program. Why are we launching a shell? Well, date isn't just a program, right? Date exists at some location on the file system, and we need to be able to find that. We might need to do other things than just run the single keyword date. We might have a more complex operation when it comes to running some program. And it turns out it's very convenient to have our shell. You know, you think about, right, you're on some terminal uh, frequently and you're interacting with the shell and you're typing human uh, intelligent, uh, legible, visible, right? It makes sense to a human commands into your shell. And your shell's entire job is to parse up that statement you're making and convert that into program invocations, right? It's going to parse this string of data. Fundamentally, a shell is a parser, and then it runs things, right? I mean, a lot of programs can be viewed in that sense. But we have this shell. It parses your user input and then goes and finds those programs and exec VEs them, et cetera, right? So we use the shell. It's very uh, useful to just have a shell go and do that parsing for us so that we don't have to uh, run our exec VE system call ourselves. We'd like to just say, hey, run date. And rather than run exec VE user bin date, pass in this arg v, arg v uh, parameter, pass in this environment thing, you know, just let the shell take care of that. It's a lot simpler. So it's very common to use uh, the shell to do that, to just do that parsing for you. So we invoke the shell and we specify, hey, we're going to launch up the shell. We're going to be providing this dash C argument. So dash C basically means whatever this next argument is, I need you to go ahead and parse that and run it as if I had uh, typed that into my terminal, into my shell myself, right? Imagine, you know, you're sitting at your 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 shell, you're, you're running, interacting, uh, interacting very intentionally with the shell and you type in date and you hit enter, right? You imagine the date coming back. Well, we can also just do sh-c date and it would parse it in much the same way as if you were interactively doing that. So we run that program and 
in response, the shell parses that string of date and it says, okay, well, I need to find the date. It goes and finds the date, searching through the path environment variable. Eventually it finds the date program and it exactly is the date program, passes in a single argument, passes in this environment, etc. And suddenly after all of this uh, low level detail of running system date, we get the date back in response, right? We print out, standard out the date. Okay, so we might, as I said, want something a little more complex, and this is where you know people are comfortable interacting with the shell, so it's nice to have the shell doing parsing rather than just manually crafting these exec v system calls yourself. Uh, we might want to specify a time zone for the date, and date can print out the current time uh, in a time zone specific manner if supplied with some time zone environment variable. So within our shell, if we want to specify an environment variable before running a program, we kind of put that before the program we want to run with this equal signs, kind of setting up a key equals some value, space our program name. So we do TZ for time zone equals UTC, uh, and we specify that we want to run the date program. So our shell goes through, it parses that, and it realizes what it means to do that. So it translates this into an exec VE system call by parsing it and translating it. And it runs the date program now uh, with an environment variable added that is the time zone being UTC. So it launches that up. The program runs under this environment uh, variable, and this may potentially influence the date program, of course, because it might look at its environment variables. You might instead specify MST, you want a different time zone, and again, this is going to influence the date program because the date program is looking at this environment variable, and it's going to change the output. Okay, so this is all a bunch of commands you might do. You might have some web application or a different application, but you might have some web application that wants to be able to get the date and might want to get the date um, with the user specified time zone. We might want uh, different users accessing our web application from different time zones. We might want them to be able to kind of specify their specific time zone and the web application might use that user input and just kind of inject it in here, right? Where, where we have in red, that is user input. The user input is specifying we want a time zone of MST for whatever reason, right? Maybe you can specifically specify that. Maybe your account knows your time zone. You can imagine how this user data flows in some way. Uh, and that user data ends up here being MST. Okay, now the issue, and this is a very big issue, is that we're just concatenating kind of TZ equals user input and then space date. We're concatenating the string together and we're just pushing this off to the shell to parse and do with it what it's going to do. So it worked great when we were just specifying very simple strings that were time zones. And so our web application works great. It works awesome. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. Turns out our web application does more than it's supposed to do. Because this data is ending up in a shell that's just parsing it and then making making exec VE calls in response to how it parsed this data, well, the shell is a very powerful tool. It has, for example, this backtick operator, where this backtick operator, if we kind of put something in between two backticks, the shell parses that, and when it parses that, it thinks to itself, okay, I need to run now this command, and then I'm going to substitute the output in to this string. So it, it does command substitution. The shell is a very powerful thing. It does more than just type in a simple program, find it, run it. It can do uh, this concept of command substitution with this backtick operator. So if we specify through our user input that we want backtick who am I backtick, Suddenly our shell parses this, it figures out, okay, I need to run the user bin who am I program to figure this out so I can substitute the result of that in for our time zone environment variable. And it says, okay, well, who am I? We launch up that program, I am root. And now we're going to substitute that in for our time zone and we're going to run user bin date now with the time zone of root, right? We kind of, the shell is a very complex process that does parsing, of our data and then make system calls in response to it, doing substitution operations in this case, doing all sorts of different operations depending on the particular shell operation you specify through this blob of data, this string of data that you send off to the shell. Okay, so that works great here. Uh, but what if maybe we don't even want to run the date program? We truly have full control right now or a, a very 
aggressive level of control over the shell that's about to be launched if I have user input right here. So I can just start my user input with semicolon. So we're going to say time zone is the empty string. Basically the time zone is nothing. We don't have time zone. We're just going to immediately semicolon that to end this uh, particular shell statement and begin a new shell statement. And then we're going to say, who am I? We're going to run the who am I program. And then we're going to do space pound. And the pound is just a comment operator within our shell, which means everything after this is going to be a comment. We're going to ignore this. So we run kind of effectively two statements. The first statement we run is time zone equals empty. And in response, our shell parses this, understands that, doesn't have to run any programs in response to that. We've just set up an environment variable and kind of effectively done nothing with it. So we exec the E, uh, we don't exec the E anything because we parsed it very quickly. We got ready to build up this environment variable thing and then no command ran. So we just kind of throw that out and we're done with that. Begin the new statement. Well, the new statement is who am I? And then you could almost imagine, right, that we almost ran date, but we didn't because it's just a comment. So we parse that. It's a comment. We throw that out. All we're doing now effectively is running the who am I program. So now we exec VE, user bin who am I. We run it with who am I as the first argument. And suddenly the output is root. So you can imagine that if we were running this command and then we were returning that to the user, the user now has this capability of running whatever program they want on that web server. They can just do this semicolon space, the command they want to run space pound sign, and they can just put whatever they want in between that semicolon and pound, and they can run any program they want on the server. They're executing arbitrary programs on the server, which of course is a little bit terrifying, right? We don't want our users probably being able to specify a time zone of semicolon space, who am I space pound sign, and suddenly the who am I program is running. We didn't intend for that. We just wanted this nice little shell thing to parse our environment variable. Why is it doing this? Well, it's doing this because you're using a shell, and this shell is a very powerful tool. You probably didn't want to use a shell for performing this operation. You probably wanted just a basic little parser that would go through and parse uh, the environment variable and set that up correctly and then run the date program. You didn't want to use the full power of the shell. Of course, it worked for our basic uh, use case of it, right? It works for just specifying a simple time zone, but it does much more. And this is what command injection is. This is the power of command injection. And this is the power of kind of this concept of injecting data in one context into a different context. You have to really think to yourself what that broader context is, right? We're, we're executing in a shell parser context, and this is a very powerful context that can suddenly start running random programs. Okay, so that's command injection. Now, we have all sorts of injection techniques, all sorts of injection attributes or uh, injection uh, types. And the reason for that is, as I said earlier, it's very common for user data to flow into a system and like be used as part of other data and just kind of flow through the system, right? All programs are is like taking data and like manipulating it and moving the data in different ways. So obviously injecting data is a common operation. So there's all sorts of injection attacks, it turns out, in response to that. So in this case, we're looking at HTML, right? We can imagine some user specifies their name in some way and suddenly the web server responds with some HTML saying, hey, hello to your name. Hello, comma, space, Connor, in this case, exclamation point. All within these, uh, these P tags. Okay, well, what happens if I say that my name is script alert one script? Well, suddenly it's not so cool. It's not just suddenly saying what my name is. You know, maybe as a web developer, I thought, wait, why would anyone supply anything other than their name? That would be crazy. But they can supply any data they want. It's up to your server to deal with this arbitrary data. And if someone says that their name is script alert one script, you need to be ready for that because it turns out that you're not just in a name context, you're in an HTML context. It can be arbitrary HTML and your browser is gonna go and parse this. And in the case of this, fortunately, you know, the person said their name was alert one and this isn't such a big issue. Uh, because it's just a little pop-up, but you can imagine much worse situations where we start running arbitrary JavaScript. Now, one thing to note here with this HTML injection sort of thing is if a user is sending data at the web server and the response is coming back based off of that data, right? In this way, a user is only kind of attacking themselves, right? It doesn't really 
so what if I can run arbitrary uh, JavaScript against myself? You know, I'm on this computer. I could have just opened up Node and started running my own JavaScript anyways. There's not really any security significance to this, right? Who cares if a user hacks themselves? Like, what does that even mean? Like, cool. Like, yeah, you could have already done that. Like, it's there's no special thing that now you're like, hacking yourself through this web server, it's kind of useless. But where this is important is if your name, for example, gets stored into a database. Let's say you're creating your user and you specify your user's name and you specify your user's name as script alert one script. And then let's say there's some operation or maybe the main page of this web application lists all of the users that are registered for the website. Well, now when some other user goes to access this website, suddenly we have an issue because suddenly now this user that specified their name is running arbitrary JavaScript on some other user system. And this is the security concern. This is a problem because we have now convinced, uh, we've kind of used this server in the middle as a way for person A to run code on person B's system. And this is, now that's that's scary, right? You, it's person B didn't sign up for person A to run code on their server uh, or on their system. It trusted that this web application would uh, not be crazy. And of course, it's also going to be trusting the browser not to do anything uh, too insane once it is executing arbitrary code. But this is a very scary concept, right? We don't want uh, some user to be able to use my server to run code on some other user's browser. This is no good. My, my web application, I intended only for you to specify a name. I'm kind of expecting, you know, maybe your name only has uh, alphabetic characters, right? I don't expect a name to have a less than sign or a greater than sign or some parentheses in there. So maybe we sanitize in that way, maybe say, hey, the username needs to only have alphabetic characters or you can maybe start escaping characters. Maybe if we see this less than and we know that it's gonna end up in an HTML context, well, it turns out we can do like ampersand GT semicolon and that'll display the less than or that'll display a greater than symbol, uh, but it won't treat it as an HTML tag of a greater than symbol. So there's various techniques to solving this problem, but this is the, the fundamental issue, right? We've got data being injected from one context into a much more powerful context than potentially the web developer realized, right? They thought they were in this name context. You're not in a name context. You're in an HTML context. This is scary. Okay, so that's HTML injection. Turns out there is SQL injection. You've probably maybe heard of it. So SQL injection, we can imagine, or I guess in this case, we're just looking at SQL. Uh, we can imagine you might need to go and perform some database operation. Let's say you're logging into your user and you're going to specify your username and password. Well, the web application needs to go and see, hey, is this username and password cor even correct? Well, it's going to go ahead and take your username and it's gonna take your password and it's going to kind of concatenate it into the SQL operation in this case. So we're going to do a select star from users where username equals Connor and password equals password one, two, three. This works great. I entered my username and password correctly. It's all good. We find my user, I get logged in. The issue of SQL injection is that we're not just in a username context or just in a password context. We are in a SQL context. So I can, for example, specify my username as admin if I want to get ready to log into the admin user. We can imagine we don't actually know admin's password. Of course, we can see it here on the slide, but maybe you know you want to log into the admin uh, user and you don't know their password. Well, I don't need to know their password. I'm in a SQL context. I can just finish out this SQL statement uh, as I see fit. So I can say, okay, well, my username is admin and my password is single quotes or one equals one space dash dash. So in this case, that dash dash is a comment operator. It basically means everything after the dash dash should just be ignored. It's just a comment. Don't, don't look at it. And now we're basically saying, well, find me all of the users whose username is admin and their password is the empty string. None have the empty string, but that's okay or one equals one, well, that's true. And if we do this with an or, so if their password is an empty string or true, which means all of that together is just true, effectively all we're doing now is we're selecting from users where the username is admin. 
boom, logged in. Great. We didn't even need to know their password. I, I can kind of pretend the password is quote or one equals one dash dash. It's not. Uh, but we can see here, right, this SQL injection. Uh, we've got this context issue, right? Again, we've got data. We kind of maybe the web application developer kind of thinks, oh, we're just in a username context or we're just in a password context. But you're not. You are in a SQL context. So it, whatever we're building up here, we're concatenating all of this data together, we're building a SQL statement. And we need to be very careful that we understand the context our data is in. So it turns out there's solutions to this. We can, for example, within SQL specifically, we can replace this uh, username and password with question marks. And then we can have SQL go through and parse out this whole query and understand that it has a username that equals something undetermined yet, but we're, we're just parsing, we're building out the abstract syntax tree of this SQL query. We've got this unknown username and unknown password and then bind the data in after the fact. Rather than just building up this whole statement that is going to get parsed all together, you kind of do your parsing and then do your data filling. And SQL fortunately, uh, permits this using this kind of question mark operator concept and then it does the parsing and then fills in the data. It's very dangerous when you fill in the data and then do the parsing. You really, in an ideal world, in every context, would kind of do your parsing and then your data filling. Okay, so that's SQL injection. And one more kind of interesting thing that we'll point out that isn't normally traditionally thought of in a web security context, but is certainly along these same lines an injection issue is the stack. So the stack we can imagine, we're living in C, of course, you could write your web server in C. So this certainly could be a web application security concept, or really, I mean, all, all languages at some point are like using a stack, uh, but not super critical. In this case, we're looking at C, and it, again, it could be a web server, though, you know, most, well, most web servers probably aren't written in C. But we've got this function foo, and it's a very simple operation. It takes in some input and some length, and we've got this local buffer within our function called buffer, and we're going to copy into the buffer uh, the specified input with a specified length. So in this case, we're going to invoke this function. We're gonna type foo, and then we're gonna pass bar in three, right? The length of bar is three. So what we're going to do here is we're going to execute this, and what's going to happen is that bar is going to end up on the stack, right? So we're going to execute the function, bar ends up on the stack, and then we return to whatever this hypothetical next statement is after foo, right? And in doing so, in order to do so, uh, if we think about the mechanics, the runtime of C, how this all works, of x86, we push, uh, when we do this call operation within x86, we push our return address to the stack so that we know how to get back to where we're going to be going, right? So on the stack exists where I should go to after I'm done with this function. So in this case, it's kind of like this 555 address that ends with 42. And we know based on, because that's on the stack, eventually we're going to return there. We're gonna kind of do this ret operation, this pop into the uh, instruction pointer um, concept, right? And we're going to return execution, resume execution at the statement after this function call, ultimately once we return from it. So that's how that's maintained. So we've got this context, right? We've put bar on the stack. Well, we might put 16 A's on the stack, right? We call it with 16 A's and again, right? We fill up the stack 16 A's and we return to this 55 blah, 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 42 address after the fact, kind of this hypothetical address we can imagine. Somehow this program got compiled, there's addresses, you know, it's gonna go somewhere. Uh, this is what we're imagining this return location to be. Now, these are all fine, right? We've Maybe this program doesn't make much sense. It's not very useful just kind of copying some data to the stack, but you can imagine, right, you're gonna have data movement operations happening all over the place in your programs. This isn't, even though this is a very simple version and this, this function doesn't really do anything, Obviously, there are going to be functions copying data to the stack. Um, so we've got this operation here. And hopefully you see where this is going, right? We've got a massive problem here when suddenly we inject data onto the stack where we're kind of going past the bounds of our buffer. We've kind of declared our buffer to be 16 bytes long and it worked fine for 16 bytes. It turns out it works fine for a little bit more. 
uh, but eventually you're going to start injecting into this stack context, right? You're going to leave this buffer context and you're going to be in this broader stack context, which contains more than just your buffer. It contains metadata about where control flow of your program is supposed to return to when this function is done. So in this case, we copy onto the stack a bunch of A's, a bunch of B's, a bunch of C's. And suddenly I'm no longer, when this function goes to return, able to return to that 555, so on, uh, 42 address. Now I'm going to be returning to this 43, 43, 43, 43, all this C address thing, um, which likely doesn't exist in our program. And suddenly our program segmentation faults, right? It tries to, the processor tries to go and access memory there. Turns out that memory has not been uh, allocated and suddenly we have a segmentation fault, program crash, no good, program's dead. Um, which is a problem in and of itself, right? We kind of have this denial of service potentially against our web application or whatever application and we just crash the program. This is, this is no good. But we can do more than that. We can actually fully control where we're going to return to. We don't have to just crash the program. We can dictate where it's going to go next. So in this case, I'm running it with 16 A's followed by eight B's followed by one exclamation point. And it turns out that the exclamation point, and also we can note here that we have, let's say, this win function, this other function that nobody calls but exists nonetheless at this 21, this 555521 address. And hopefully you can see, right, if we suddenly uh, inject data onto the stack and we are no longer just in this buffer context, now we're in this full broader stack context, uh, suddenly we've overwritten one byte of that return address, that metadata that know that our, our runtime is using to determine where foo should return to. We've corrupted it. It no longer is this 55542 address. Now it's this 55521 address, right? We've the, the ASCII representation of that exclamation point, hex 21 is an exclamation point, right? An exclamation point is hex 21 through ASCII. Um, so we, we introduce this exclamation point and suddenly we've overwritten one byte of our return address and we've kind of, again, we've gone from our, our buffer context into our stack context. That stack context also holds the return address context, all these different data contexts, the way the data gets interpreted. We've overwritten something and we have now made it so that when this program runs, we run foo, we we do this copy operation and then we return. No longer are we returning to the expected next statement after this foo statement. Instead, we are returning to a win function. And you can imagine the win function does all sorts of cool, you know, winner things, uh, which is awesome.